place. Take your songbook one last time and turn to page number 369. Page number 369. Now, I told you all last week that I needed to pull up the back stories of some of these hymns. And so as you're finding page 369, I'm going to give you the back story of this hymn. You can remain seated. In 1844, a young Irishman by the name of Joseph Scriven had completed his college education and returned home to marry his sweetheart. As he was traveling to meet her on the day before the planned wedding, he came upon a horrible scene. His beautiful fiance tragically uh, was laying underwater in the creek bed after falling off of her horse. Later, Scriven moved to Canada and eventually fell in love again, only to experience the devastation once again when she became ill and died just weeks before the wedding. For the second time, this humble Christian felt the loss of the woman he loved. The following year, he wrote a poem to his mother in Ireland that described the deepest friendship with Jesus he had cultivated in prayer through the hardships of his life. The poem was published anonymously at first under the title, Pray Without Ceasing. Ten years later, he finally acknowledged his well-loved text had been written by him and his friend Jesus. In 1868, attorney Charles Converse set the text to a tune and renamed it, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. So let's go ahead and sing that song and uh, think of just what this young man went through when he penned these words. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often fall pain we bear all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. The last verse Are we weak and heavy laden cumbered with a load of care precious Savior still Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. His arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a soulless there. Alrighty, take your Bibles if you would. We're going to go ahead and get started. Turn to Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians in chapter number 4 in your Bible. Let me get situated here. I'm thankful once again for the opportunity that I have to stand before you and open up the Word of God. It truly is... Can you not hear me if I stand back from the mic? Okay. Uh, yes, sir. That would be a blessing. It truly is a privilege and an honor to stand before you, and I know that uh, many of you here have been saved much longer than I've even been alive on this earth. And I do understand that, and many of you are much more fitting to stand before you tonight and teach the lesson. But I'm thankful for the opportunity that I've been given. It, uh, it helps mold me. It helps. The pressure is good. All right. Praise the Lord. Testing one, two. Testing. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and turn this off. Philippians chapter 4 in your Bible. And we will go ahead and read just two verses. Okay. Philippians 4 and verse number 11 and verse number 12. Now, we'll be turning through the Bible a little bit tonight, and um, I would love for you to follow along as best as you could. 
Um, but don't lose your place there in Philippians 4 because we'll eventually return back there. Okay? Philippians 4. Verse number 11 says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. In whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Father, for your many blessings. Thank you, Father, once again for the opportunity that we have to come to your house, Father. And we can meet openly. We don't have to hide from persecution. And Father, we have your word and we can open it. I thank you, Father, for that. I pray, Lord, that you'd please be with us tonight as we seek to learn your word better. In your name we pray. Amen. This world that we live in is geared to make us discontented people. You know, every advertisement on TV, it is pushing you to buy a product that you probably don't need. But after watching it and seeing all that it does, you think, I need that. And sometimes when you realize, you know, that's what they're doing, sometimes you still convince yourself saying, I need that. My, <laughs> my great aunt, she has since passed away now. But she was probably the, the biggest sucker for those things. Uh, she had so much of those, you know, 1999 and you get an extra one. And uh, she had so many of that stuff. But this world that we live in is geared to make you discontented. For the younger people, it's the fashion. You wear something and pretty soon... Uh, the, the, the rock stars and the ball players of the world change their fashion and everybody changes what they're wearing. And everything that we do makes us discontented people. And, and if you're not careful, as a Christian, that is not the proper way to live. Discontented with what you have. Constantly seeking for something better. Constantly seeking for something new. You know, for us as guys, it's, it's constantly trying to get a, a better car. Or, or constantly trying to get the newest, the newest tool to put in our garage. And, and, and all of these things, we create in our mind, we create in our mind needs that don't actually exist so we can come discontented with something so that way we can create the need to buy something. And if you're not careful in your life, you'll live this way, discontented. And here Paul in, in Philippians said, not that I speak in respect of want. He said, I'm not saying this to be prideful or to put myself above other people or, or to make me look like some great Christian. But he said, you know what? I've learned in whatsoever state I am, there would to be content. Now, of course, Paul's not talking about West Virginia and Mississippi and Florida. He said, you know what? I've learned that in whatever situation I find myself, he said, I've learned to be content. You know, contentment doesn't, is not completely confined to just having things. Contentment can also come with where you are in life, whether it's retired and at home, whether it's married. You see, contentment takes on so many different forms. And, and you know, Satan, if, he, if you allow him, he'll let you. He'll work at getting you discontented, and he'll steal your joy. But Paul said, you know what? I've learned that in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. So I guess the place that we should probably start today is first by defining what is contentment. What does it mean to be content? And are we truly content? Contentment, by the dictionary definition, is to limit oneself in requirements, desires, or actions. In short, to be satisfied. To be satisfied. Contentment is limiting one's fleshly desires. And you know, truly, that's where the real struggle is. That's why contentment is so hard. Because we're very in tune with what we want. We like giving ourselves what we want. We drive by Chick-fil-A, and we weren't hungry before. But we're hungry now, and we give ourselves what we want. You know what? We go to the store, and we didn't need this before. But you know, we've created the need in our mind. We've become discontent, and we buy it for ourselves. Understand that contentment is being satisfied. Limiting oneself in requirements, desires, or actions. 
being content with what you have. In 2 Corinthians in chapter number 11, understand that, that Paul was not just speaking because he had a hole in his head. We're going, to learn, we're going to look at a little bit of Paul's life, and we're going to see some of the things that Paul went through. And he said, you know what, in whatsoever state I am, I've learned to be content. In whatsoever situation I am, I've learned to be content. You know, I know that many of you in this room have gone through things and have had, um, had, have, has had troubles. But I don't know if anybody in this room has quite gone through life quite like Paul. This guy seemed like he had a double dose of every uh, bad luck and uh, anything bad that could possibly happen to you. Here in 2 Corinthians 11, in chapter number 23, it says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths off. Now understand, this is Paul telling, you know what? Let me give you my list of accomplishments, so to speak. He said, let me give you my list of, of things that I've been through. And, and, and if you read this, it, it kind of sounds like he's being prideful, but he's not. He's, under, he's trying to teach a point saying, you know what? I've been through this all as well. He said, and I don't count it for anything, but verse number 24. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, saved one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered, I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in, per in perils of my own countrymen, in, per in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, perils means danger, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Here Paul is saying, look at some of the things that I have been through. He, he says, you know what, I live in, in, in dangers of, of heathen, in dangers of the city, in dangers of in the wilderness, in the sea. He said, you know what, I've been shipwrecked many times, a night and a day I've been in the deep. Though many of us here have been in accidents, you know, I don't think we've spent the whole night and the next day, standing outside in the cold. Here Paul is stuck in the deep, floating around for that time. And he says, you know what, thrice, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, and if you remember that story, he was left for dead. And how could a man like Paul experience all of this? The Jews, which were his own countrymen, his own blood, said five times received I forty stripes, save one. He said five different times from the Jews, they beat me with thirty-nine stripes. Five different times. How could a man like Paul say, you know what? I've been shipwrecked. I've been in prison. I'm in danger just about everywhere I go. I've been beaten with rods. I've been stoned. I've been beaten with whips. And yet, in every situation that I find myself, I'm content. In whatsoever state I am, I've learned to be content. How does a man do that? You understand that if that was me, you know, after, after about 38 stripes, or after going through that twice, I would seriously be considering whether or not it's worth it. Whether or not it's worth it to take all of that. And you know what? I would probably, in my own mind, I'm human. I would probably think, you know what? If there is a God in heaven who truly loves me the way he says he does, why would he let me endure such things? If I was floating around in the ocean for 8 hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, I would think, you know what? Where is God? But Paul said, you know what? In whatsoever state I am, I've learned to be content. I've learned to be happy with my situation. I've learned to be satisfied. Would that be you today? <laughs> if we were to drop you in the ocean, <laughs> let's say, just for eight hours, could you say, you know what? I'm content. <laughs> I'm happy with the situation that's been given to me. If we were to take you out back and all of us were to take two licks on you with a whip, would you say, you know what, give me a third. I'm happy with what you've given me. If we said, you know what, here you go, you're going to starve a little bit. Could you say, you know what, I'm content. 
You understand? Paul has, he, he said, in whatsoever state I am, I've learned to be content. And you know what? He had the background to prove it. He, he had the stories to tell. He said, you know what? I've been in the deep. He said, I've been stoned before. He said, I've learned to be content. But understand this. That wasn't always Paul. That wasn't always Paul who, who said, you know what? I've learned to be content in every situation. Turn forward in your Bible, if you would. Before you start beating yourself up and saying, you know what? I could never be content with my situation. I could never be a Paul. Remember that Paul had to learn this lesson too. 2 Corinthians, the next, in the next chapter, verse number 12. You know what we find? We find Paul it is talking to God. And he's saying, God, you know what? I have a thorn in my flesh. He, he, said, he said, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. He said, I have this thing that's bothering me. And you know what, God? I, I would like for you just to remove it. If you could remove this, God, from my side, if you could remove this from my life, this ailment, whatever it is, we don't exactly know. I'm thinking in Paul's mind, he's saying, you know what? I could serve you better. Many, many uh, scholars of the Word think that perhaps this, this issue that he had was perhaps with his eyesight ever since the road to Damascus. And many times uh, to prove that, many of the books that were written by Paul were not actually written physically with his own hand. They are written by a penman. And only in a couple times Paul says, you know what, I write this with my own hand. And so many men believe that, you know what, it was a problem with his eyes. We don't exactly know. One day I would love to find out and I'll ask him. But you know, Paul's saying, God, I, I could be a better Christian. I could do so much more for you if you just remove this from my life. You see, Paul was discontented in that moment. He said, you know what, God, I could do more for you if you do it. You know, you say, well, it was, it was for a good reason. He wasn't happy. He wasn't satisfied with the situation that he found himself in. And here God says, in verse number 9 of chapter 12, He said, And He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He said, you know what? He said, I've learned that in my weakness, he said, when I'm at my lowest point, God is on his throne in my life. And he said, I can rely on his strength. He said, you know what? I've learned that because of that. He said, you know what? I welcome the infirmities. He said, I welcome these problems to come. He said, because when they come... His strength is made perfect. You know what? I understand who God is a little bit more. I understand the power and the love that He has for me. Because you know what? He takes me through this low time. I, I want to get discontent. I, I, I want to be unsatisfied. I don't like it. But you know what? I learned that when I'm in that time, that God shows Himself strong in my life. And I didn't do this on purpose, but the song, uh, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, the, 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 the writer of that song, that is the message that he's telling you. He's saying, you know what? In the lowest times of my life, when God took my first fiancé and my second, he said, I learned to rely on God. It strengthened my prayer life. And you know what? If you would ask him now, if you could go back and change anything, what would you change? I don't think you would say, I would ask God to give me back my fiancé. I think you would say, you know what? It was perfect. Because through all of that, I learned who my God is. I learned what a friend I have in Jesus. I, I, I learned that, you know what? I can go to Him. He's anywhere. And here Paul is saying, you know what? I learned... That when I'm at my lowest point, when I'm weak, he's strong. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
You know, I know that I, we're not Apostle Pauls in this room. But I would like to reach the point where I say, you know what, God? I glory in my infirmities. I, I glory whenever you touch my body and you take my health. I glory whenever you touch my life and it hurts. He says, so the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'm not there yet. Pray for me. But you know what? How are you doing in your life? I hope, I hope there's one in this room that can say, you know what I've learned? That in my weakness, God is strong. I, I, I've learned that His grace is sufficient. But you know what? Paul had to learn this lesson for himself. You see, 2 Corinthians was written before, or Philippians was written after 2 Corinthians. After he went all this, through all this, after he went through this, asking God and asking God, will you please remove this trial from my life? Will you remove this struggle that I have so I can serve you better? God answered and said, my grace is sufficient. And later, in Philippians, he penned, do you know what? I have learned that in every situation, I can be content. I can be satisfied with what I have. Now what's Paul's secret? How can a man who's been through so much learn such a hard lesson be able to say that? And it'd be written in the Holy Scriptures for eternity. First thing that I think is the key to, 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 Paul's, to, Paul's, to Paul's success in this is this. The first key of finding true contentment only comes by knowing God. And that's where it starts. You're, you're never going to be completely content if you don't know God. There's a God-sized hole in everybody's life. And it can't be filled with anything else. You can try all the money you want. You can try all the drugs. You can try the alcohol. You can try living it up. That, that hole will never be filled with anything else. True contentment first comes by knowing God. You may be able to find temporal happiness in those things, in the drugs and the alcohol, but true joy can only come by, by knowing God. Say, what else? How did Paul find this, this secret to contentment? How was he able to withstand all the trials? Because Paul understood this. He understood that his God was in control. He knew God. He, he, he knew God personally, but he understood as well that his God is in control. And, and you know what? In my life, I know God. I'm saved. And if you're, not, if you're here tonight and you're not saved, you don't, need, you don't know God personally, that's where you need to start. I want to show you. If you want to know, you come and talk to me after the service. I'll show you how you can know God. But you know what? That wasn't enough. You have to understand that God is in control of everything. That God's hand, that God is sovereign, that nothing happens without His notice. You have to understand that God is in control. And the third thing that Paul realized was, he was just satisfied with what God had given him. He knew God, he knew his God was in control, and he was just satisfied with it. You understand that God loves you? You understand that God's not going to give you more than you can bear, as we talked about last week? And whatever trial that you find yourself in, whatever problem, whatever time of testing, you understand He's still in control. He's there watching you. The Bible says He's a good Father that desireth, just as a father desireth to give his children gifts. God is the same. He's a Father that desires to give His children good gifts. Do you view Him that way? Do you view Him as that loving Father that says, you know what, I want you to turn out right. I want to give you these good things. If we're not careful, we'll view him as just a judge sitting on a throne and just waiting for us to mess up, to cast judgment. But that's not the Father that I know. Hebrews 13 in chapter number 5 says this. 13 chapter 5, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Understand that God is with you. That, that once you're saved, once you know God, there's nothing you can do to get away from Him. There's nothing you can do to, to miss out on heaven. You understand He's with you. 
second first Timothy chapter six. First Timothy chapter six. Verse number six says this But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But godliness with contentment is great gain. You, you understand that the whole discontentment mentality is driven by wanting to have more, wanting to fulfill an emptiness, wanting just to have things, or things to be different. And you understand here, that here in 1 Timothy 6, it says godliness coupled with contentment is great gain. You know, there's lots of profit in, in being godly and being content. Those two together, they make a powerful pair. Brings you great gain. Verse number 8, though, says this. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. I said, you know what? You have food, you have clothes. Be satisfied with that. Be content with that. You understand that, that God, if He had just given us salvation and stopped, we should be content. But He gave us so much more. He's given us so much more. He, he's given us so many blessings that we fail to mention on a daily basis. Godliness with contentment is great gain. He said, you know what? Be content with just raiment, with, with your clothing, and with food. Back to Philippians 4.13, and, and we'll be done for tonight. Back to Philippians. This verse here is often taken out of context. Andrew would know the basketball player Stephen Curry. He put this on his shoe. And uh, one company wouldn't, wouldn't make his shoe because he wanted to put a Bible verse on it. And Christians idolized him because of it. And whenever he finally put it on his shoe, all, all he put was, I can do all things. He, he took out the most important part of this verse. And so this verse here, though, goes right in line with our text. This is a verse that comes right after. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. This is Paul. He just said, you know what? I've learned in whatsoever state I am there with to be content. You know why Paul said, you know what? I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me? Because Paul learned those hard lessons. And he said, you know what? When I'm weak, then is he strong. You know what? If you're here tonight, and you're discontent, you have no excuse to be discontent. If you know God, if you understand His power, He's in control of all things, then just be satisfied with what He's given you. Be content. Understand He is in control. You say, but my situation is hard. Let Him show Himself strong in your weakness. And I know that I'm saying that, and I'm young, and I don't, I may not wholly understand everything I'm saying, because life hasn't hit me as hard as it's hit some of you. But I hope that when this time comes, this message will once again ring true in my mind, that we can trust Him, that you know what, His grace is sufficient, that His is made perfect in our weakness. The definition I give to contentment is this. When you come to a point when God is all you want because God is all you need. When you come to a point when God is all you want because God is all you need. This is true contentment. This is where the secret lies for Paul. You understand this? Contentment is a matter of decision not possession. It's a matter of decision, not possession. You understand? You have everything that you need tonight to be a contented person. If you know Christ, all you have to do is change your thinking. Because somewhere along the lines, you've gotten off track and you thought, you know what, maybe God forgot about my needs. Maybe He's not in control of this situation. All you have to do is go back and say, you know what, God? You're still God. You're still on the throne. 
and I'm going to be satisfied with what you've given me. We can be contented Christians tonight. I hope that we don't go through some of these things that Paul went through. But you know what? I would love to know God the way Paul went, the way Paul knew God. Understand, you can be content tonight. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. I thank you, Father, for how it helps us in our daily life. Lord, I pray that we would be a contented people. That we would not live, Father, as the world constantly seeking the newest fashion, the newest crave, the newest thing on the market, Father. We would not be discontented in the trials and the problems that, you've, that you throw our way, Father, to test us. I pray, Lord, that in times of trial, Lord, that I would remember back to how good you are in my life. I pray, Lord, that you'd please help us to take your word tonight and we would apply it to our heart, Father, and be better Christians because of it. Thank you, Father, for these ones that are here tonight. I pray, Lord, that you'd please give them safety and a good remaining part of this week. And we love you, Father. Thank you for who you are. In your name we pray. Amen. All righty. You are dismissed. It was good to see you. We'll see you back in church on Sunday.